welcome in the Pure Secure podcast. And today I have with me Joshua Liberman. He's the president and founder of Net Sciences. Um, I'm not sure if I if I can say what you exactly do with that company, um, but you yeah. supply, if I understand, um, small and medium businesses on IT, right? I do. So we're an IT services provider. We're a managed service provider as well. We have a very strong focus on security and our target market is businesses that typically run from about 10 to 50 seats. But that's a little bit like a fish telling you that water is their target market. In the state of New Mexico, I just did this research for another call yesterday. There are 22 companies in our state with 1,000 or more employees. That's not very many large companies, but there are only 114 companies with 100 or more employees. That's a very small number. It becomes even smaller when you consider the fact that well over 100 companies manage or advertise their services as MSPs. That means that there's roughly one company of 100 or more users per MSP in our state. So obviously it doesn't work out. The distribution isn't one-to-one -one, and many companies that claim to be MSPs aren't really MSPs and they're you know, people working from the basement somewhere. But even if you look at MSPs that are four or five employees and up that work in a commercial location, or at least used to, uh, there's probably still about 40 or 50 of those. And that really means that if you're not serving businesses under 100 seats, you're probably doing something else for a living. Our median site is probably 35 to 40 seats nowadays, but that's heavily skewed by the presence of a 100 user firm and a 75 user firm. The real target market we have almost all fall within eight and 32 seats. Right. So it's a, it definitely a smaller market or a market of smaller businesses than most, which makes delivering security services harder, not just for financial reasons, but for reasons of uh, many of these businesses don't have an IT budget. They may not even have a budget. They're really still run by the seat of the pants by the founder who did just what I did. They decided they were good at what they did. They were tired of working for somebody else. And they figured uh, if they were going to work for an asset, might as well be themselves. So a lot of the people grew their businesses very organically that way. And they're, they're not business people. And some of them are smart enough and have grown enough to hire business people and to let them make decisions independently. But that is actually not very many of them. So you're negotiating, educating, explaining to, and working with people who have extremely limited IT backgrounds or the, um, I, I don't wanna say the ability to grasp these things, but the desire to grasp these things yeah. is highly limited. Yeah. None of this is unique. Every MSP has some of that, but I live in that. Right. I have one site, I'm sorry, two sites that have IT people there, period. And in the last 10 years, I've only had one other. So it's extremely rare for me to be talking to somebody who has any idea what I'm talking about, <laughs> uh, if, if I'm not kidding. Okay, I have a stupid question because um... You've been mentioning MSP quite some times now, but what, what does MSP stand for? Managed Service Provider. Right. And it, does that incorporate everything with the IT involved in the company? So you're asking me to define MSP? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I can give you a definition. And as long as you ask nine other people, you'll have no more than nine other definitions. <laughs> but, but the bottom line is many service providers are IT service providers that provide ongoing, typically contracted, proactively delivered services that are also predominantly remotely delivered by means of tools and processes and the end goal, whose end goal is to provide excellent uptime, security and data protection so that their customers are around indefinitely to pay their bills. That's, uh, that's always and, good. <laughs> yeah, so that's the basics. But then it gets 
so much broader. We also do hosted voice phone system or voice phone systems. We do uh, on site. Uh, I'm sorry. We do hosted security cameras. The cameras are on site, but then they're they're web hosted. We do uh, well. There's an NVR on site. I also do process consulting, at least as concerns IT con uh, concerns, and some of the better in this field are really deeply embedded in their customers' processes. Others never get there at all. They're just always the IT guys. So I think the best MSPs have broad remits and deep penetration into the business practices and um, planning and procedures of the way their customers run their business. And other ones are still at the fringe and the margin and they're, you know, they're delivering services and putting out fires. Right. We've migrated to maybe be two thirds of the way towards that the other end of the spectrum, but never as fast or as fully as I wanted to. Hmm. You said before, okay, it, it is extremely difficult in one way because the business owner or the entrepreneur is um, not interested in this topic, not Generally involved, yes. they, don't, they don't understand, so um, they have no budget. So how do you convince them that they need to invest in security? Well, for one thing, I don't, I just had a long discussion about this on a panel yesterday. I generally speaking, don't sell security. That doesn't mean we don't deliver it, but we don't sell it. We sell uptime, productivity, capabilities. We sell the concept that without security, there is no business. I mean, you, when people ask me what we can do for them, quite honestly, I can save their business because if they do nothing, or they do inadequate things, then if there's just so much malicious activity out there at this point that businesses that don't do anything will fail. Now, the problem is I can't tell them how much is enough. And I can't tell them how much is 1% more than just barely enough. So we tend to err towards the far side. Uh, do you know the phrase dead reckoning? Does that mean anything to no. you? or orienteering? No. Or orienteering is route finding in the wilderness. You can go out and just get lost and get found. I used to do that when I was a kid. A dead reckoning in that sense refers to, let's just imagine you're on a trail and you're, you know that this trail intersects with another trail. And you know that from that intersection, either to the, just to the east or just to the west of it, there's a stream and you're thirsty. You can try to hit it and then guess which way to turn. Or you can decide that, look, I'm gonna go a whole mile to the west, because I know then there's a 99% chance the stream is to the east. If I try to nail it, I don't know which way to turn, but I know if I overshoot it enough, I will know which way to turn. I try to do security that way. We cover the bases, we, we use layers, we try to deeply uh, proliferate all of the different services. I would prefer that even if we make a mistake or overlook something or deal with the inevitable, uh, I'm going to call it I square, uh, I you idiot user, because they, I mean, people are human. They're going to make mistakes and a lot of them are determined to make the same mistakes repeatedly until they perfect them. You have to be all a dead reckon around that. You have to have understand that no matter how well you do your job, some things will fail, you'll make some mistakes, and the people you support will make a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. So somehow you have to be so thoroughly covered that you still get out the other side and you know which way to turn and, and find the stream. So we try to dead reckon our way in that sense and just saturate things. Instead of explaining things in technical terms, which is extremely rare in my experience, or it's effective in extremely rare circumstances, I just try to build analogies as you've already experienced and, and draw people into a way of thinking that they can appreciate. And I do that by looking into the industry that they're in. And if they're in HVAC or law or accounting or finance, I look at analogies in their industry and try to uh, couch my terminology and build my presentation and discussions in terms they'll understand. Until occasionally they say, okay, stop. Just tell me, <laughs> and that does happen. But generally speaking, it's more entertaining and it's more circuitous, just like the last five minutes. And 
does that mean that they always come when something bad already happened? Well, it doesn't mean that. I, at least I don't think what I said adds up to that. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, because they are not, they don't have the knowledge. And I think you come in at some point when they call you and yeah, and they have to have a reason to make a call. And if they don't care about or don't understand the security of their IT network or their internet and so on, or the email or whatever, they have no reason to call, right? Largely, that's true. So I can give you a true story that's very interesting to me. And it's about the worst or the most thoroughly penetrated network we've ever been to. And it was just in the last couple of years, maybe a year and a half ago, maybe two. Uh, we had a small site that, that's grown. Uh, and, and by small, I mean, they're probably a multi-million, but not a $10 million business. And there's probably 40 or 50 people, but only 10 or 15 computer users. We supported them when they were smaller, but they always fought our recommendations. And I'm, I'm very big on setting the bar and saying, you must be this ride, this tall to take the ride. And somehow they always wanted to limbo under the bar. They didn't understand the concept of stepping over the bar. So they were difficult and they limboed under that bar without us at some point. Uh, and when they next called us a couple of years later, they called us because they had decided they were going to do online banking and transactions. And in the process of setting that up, their bank rejected them and told them, look, you, they run a piece of software. I believe they ran Trustier, but there are software uh, that banks now require users to, or companies to use that are their vetting tools. They make sure that there are certain levels of security in place before they interact with you. So their bank wouldn't vet them to do these online transactions. What I found so interesting is, so they changed banks and instead of calling, and when the second bank wouldn't allow it, that was enough of a trigger for them to call us. And, and of course we used to work with them and we had some familiarity with their site. But what we didn't know is that after they let us go, they had a, an employee who always knew the cheaper way to do something. So they had removed the firewall and or removed the endpoint protection and uh, dropped their backup and gone to a single shared password. If I remember right, it was four or five characters, the dictionary word that everybody had and more. I, I mean, ultimately we replaced every piece of hardware there. Uh, we got them a new domain name and a new tenancy in 0365. And uh, we've migrated everything. They had to leave everything behind. They were just so well known and so well penetrated. They were, they were a submarine built of screen doors at that point. So we had, we just had to migrate it. The good news is there was enough pain and fear and discomfort that they actually did everything we asked them to do. There was still a bit of a struggle. They were still, you know, still looking at an option to limbo here or there, but ultimately they crossed that bar. And now they've been a client again for, I think, I'll look it up, maybe 18 months. And they are fine. As a matter of fact, they routinely um, have one of the most secure networks. Now they st still have wiring that's an absolute mess and they still have ongoing issues. Uh, that same person who knew how to do things cheaply built them the most impressive spreadsheet based application I've ever seen. Uh, she linked half a dozen spreadsheets with thousands of cells and hundreds of dependencies or interactions. Uh, they, she basically built a relational database by linking a series of flat file, you know, Excel products together. It's incredible what she did. And they've run their business on that for years. So it routinely fails or gets corrupted uh, by she also made it a multi-user product. It's amazing what she did. She was so smart. If we could have enlisted her as an ally, it would have been amazing, but she, she just didn't see things that way. So we've been working with them to get a custom piece of software built. So when we met them, there was no firewall backup or endpoint protection. And now, which admittedly there was a bit of a trough in the middle there, they're having custom software designed and they have a full security stack. So it, it was pretty damn nifty, but you're right, they did wait 
We like to tell people that when we have to, we put out fires, it's much better to build things out of fireproof materials. Uh, but you know, ultimately what we want is everybody comes to work wearing Nomex, which is fireproof underwear and outer garments. If you race cars, you know about it. Uh, we want them to come to work in Nomex in a fireproof building uh, with fire you know, extinguishers and automated systems and monitoring in place. People tend to light themselves on fire on a regular basis and they just don't notice. And it, it's really funny. There's a wonderful Pink Floyd album cover uh, with a man with a burning suit jacket on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, like, which was, was that animals? I can't remember which one that was, but the- I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, anyway, the bottom line is about a half the hands I shake when we first meet, at least back when people shook hands, they're standing there on fire and they haven't even noticed the smell yet. They, and they assume that if they don't, that they must not be on fire. Right, right. You know, that my favorite thing to hear, I can say with some sardonic humor is, oh, if we had a problem, we would know. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> Have you, no, what has changed since um, uh, Corona? It's, because we, people started working from home a lot more and, and you are in these um, small business areas. So what has changed for these businesses and, and, and the work that you do for them in regards to safety? Well, I got to start this by saying a fewer of our endpoints moved to remote work than I ever expected. I expect to see more than half of them move, even more than two thirds of what we saw was about one third. Hmm. That surprised me a lot, maybe 40% now. Uh, now, part of that is that a lot of folks we support are in construction, manufacturing or assembly, or they're, in, they're basically in fields where it's a little harder to work remotely. Uh, you might call them concrete fail fields, uh, although we don't have a concrete company at the moment. But the that was part of it. But the other part was several of them just decided that whatever the rules were, they were going to do what they do. Uh, and it's a little tough. I mean, that's part of being an American, I think, is um, deciding which rules apply to you. The other half of that, though, was that a lot of the folks that made that migration already had some remote work facilities or uh, capabilities, facilities is the wrong word, uh, and they already had, I don't know, of those 30 to 40% that we moved, one half already had the capability to work remotely, they just didn't do it much at all. Now they did it always. So that was the biggest change. But the second biggest change was the fact that one year ago, every remote user we had which was no more than 10% of our site or 10% of our seats was using a managed, secured, monitored, covered machine. Most of them had laptops that we managed and they took them home and worked from there. We managed a few home user desktop machines. As that rapid, you know, the March, the Ides of March to the end of March, that two weeks or so, as that progressed, suddenly we quintupled the number of remote users or, or more. And a great number of them went to unmanaged, unknown endpoints, what I call tangos. They were these unknown threats that were lurking out there. That, that encouraged me to move away from SSL VPN connectivity, which we had been using, which included a component of endpoint vetting, by the way. We moved away from that to proxied RDS. So that was huge for us. Now, am I going to explain that to end users? Generally speaking, no. But I can tell them that it's easy to use, it's reliable, and it provides us an extra layer of abstraction, or to them, I would say, of security, because there is no direct connection between the remote machine and the target network. So we did that to provide rapid and effective and relatively secure connectivity. I also did it for free. That was a big change. Hmm. We we worked with a company called TrueGrid, who provided us exceptionally good pricing on the um, RDS, Fox 8 RDS service. And we set it up for free. 
which it turned out to be a bit more than I thought I was biting off. But we did that. And in a matter of two weeks without charge, we, I'd say we probably went from 10% of our users working remotely some of the time to 30 to 35% working remotely all of the time. So that was huge. And to augment that, the next month, also without charge, we added a SOC service to our endpoint. We already were doing EDR through Silence, uh, or at least advanced AV. Um, EDR might be a stretch for that. And we added an EDR component, endpoint detection and response. It kind of implies that there's something more than software, that there's a backend SOC involved. We, we brought us up to that, working with solutions granted, Silence and InfoSite infrastructure. Info site, I N F O C Y T E, uh, Silence C Y L A N C E, and solutions granted. We rolled them all together, or they rolled them all together, and provided this a service where now the target endpoints that people were connecting to through proxied RDS and TrueGrid were armored even better than they were before. So, what we couldn't solve is the problem of people using messy machines. And to give you the, to really put a fine point on this, one of the first people we hooked up remotely was the CEO of our largest company. I believe he's still CEO, but he had a 14 year old desktop that was originally a Windows XP machine purchased for his office from us that somebody who long ago did their IT had upgraded to Windows 7 and then later upgraded to Windows 10. I, his whole family used this device in a home without any security, uh, sorry, in, without any internet security or cyber security. So he didn't have an endpoint protection on it. We did change that, but it, that was the kind of thing that was the worst case scenario, nothing else went bad happened, but that was what we received. So we went from a fully managed fleet of completely secure endpoints to what the, uh, all overnight, I mean, in a matter of two weeks. Okay. So we, we still have dozens of unknown endpoints because what I learned the hard way is once you've done something for free, people will resist improving that at a cost. What I wanna do is proliferate a bunch of managed endpoints, newer machines that we manage for them for the sole purpose of connectivity. What I would be willing to do is to continue to use um, some of those machines that we're supporting now that are remote endpoints or not supporting now, but bring them under support and manage them. And I have found a tremendous amount of resistance to that. Part of that is the economic uncertainty uh, and in our state, that's much worse than some, but part of it is just that, hey, it's already working. It was free, let's just stick with it. Right. That's, yeah. So I, I guess, I, unfortunately, I was unaware that in the process of uh, loading the gun, I was shooting my own feet. But the, the bottom line is we kept it really working. Everybody's has the facilities they need, so to speak, to connect remotely and to work. And we're still in one piece. They're still in one piece. I'm not a big fan of relying on continued luck. So mm -hmm. I'd like to make that change this year. That's going to probably be my number one push. Right. So why did you start doing that for free? Well, because we had a, a lot of fear in our market. We had a lot of people who thought their businesses were going to collapse. Uh, we, I think I mentioned that a lot of these folks grew their business, but they didn't grow their business acumen. So a lot of them run a very, uh, what's the right word? They run with a pretty thin keel. They're, they're really just barely getting by. And they they have fear, you know. I we keep six months of run, right in the bank. Now I'm pretty conservative about that, uh, and we we're still doing that one year later or almost one year later. A lot of my sites I know don't keep two months or even one month, so that doesn't mean they don't have access to funds. But that's a lot different from having it sitting around. So there was that fear. Uh, and it turns out that New Mexico has stayed locked down, more locked down for longer than most places. Now, we also didn't go through the huge spikes that New York or Los Angeles or even some rural America has now gone through. But we've had some tough times and we're 
we're a thinly populated and thinly provisioned state in terms of health care. So there are still real challenges, I can tell you that. And I, I would expect that the second half of this year is when people will start to regain confidence, hmm. assuming things go well. Yeah. Uh, but having said all that, it was it was to assuage fears and to let people know it, it was giving back, to let them know that we cared, hmm. that they made it. I was able to do it because we had both the capacity in terms of tech time and the stability and the confidence that our networks would withstand it. Uh, we had some challenges with bandwidth, which everybody in New Mexico has. Uh, and finally, we had a couple of vendors that worked with us. The price, the costs were so minimal to us that I, mean, I can't even share what they were, but they were very low. That I could absorb that. Uh, luckily, I guess you'd say, in the beginning of 2020, we had raised our per seat prices. So that would have provided for a very much more profitable year than it did because I absorbed these costs. And I shouldn't say very much. It, it probably made two or three percent profit difference at the bottom line to us. That is not a lot of cost to extend that much capability to our users. Now I need to stay on top of this and I need to make sure that they do just what I've, I've discussed, that we start managing endpoints or replacing endpoints that we spark reminding them that these are now the weak link in every chain, these mm. unknown machines. We need to work through that this year. I'm going to build the emotional uh, momentum I'll need in the first half of the year and then start to actually execute in the second half, I hope, because I think that people's confidence will return. Yeah. Well, now with the vaccines coming, it's, it's in, right? That's that's part of it. There's, there's more than that, but yes, absolutely, that's part of it. I mean, one of the the greatest verities in our small business market is that small businesses do not spend money based on how last year was, and they generally don't even spend money based on how today is. They spend money based on what they think tomorrow will be like. And we have to realize that, you know, it's kind of a predictive or forward moving mechanism, much like the stock market is. And the stock market, at least in most advanced countries, isn't based on what has already happened. It's based on anticipation, which means it's usually completely wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, that's how businesses spend, at least smaller businesses. Obviously, the largest of our businesses, the two largest businesses in terms of revenue, those businesses never really saw a significant slowdown. Hmm. I don't think either of them fell 5%. And we grew 11% last year, which surprised me, actually. No, I, I can imagine that you grew, but I, <clears throat> what I, it's maybe not related, I'm not sure, but in, in, in when you look at anticipation, what do you expect that um, these businesses will do once the confidence is coming back and the rules become looser so that people could work more in the office again, what do you expect that happens? Do, the, do you expect that they all go back to working from the office? So my best guess is they'll do what I'll do, is that there'll be a lot more open to remote work and they'll be a lot less worried. Well, some of them will be a lot less worried about the productivity of their workers when they're remote. One of the questions that always comes up is how can I monitor my workers? And I, my answer is, how were you monitoring them before? Were you actually monitoring them? Of course you weren't, I know that. Or is the question really, how do I watch my metrics and make sure that you know our productivity doesn't lapse or when things don't fall through the cracks? And that leads to the same question, how were you doing it before? And I think that you know a lot of people talk about this has really opened up the work from home or work from anywhere. This has also opened people up to realizing that they don't really have metrics. Hmm. Uh, and I can say even in my own business, it's a very hard thing. I'm going to make a word up, I think, to metricize. Uh, it's really hard to quantify. Uh, I have some of the same control problems that others do. I, I wish I knew more about what my guys are doing at home, or let me rephrase that, what how their work works at home and you know, make sure that they're on. but. I don't know. I, I What I'm looking at is, are we getting our tasks done? And we're doing things. We're migrating our RMM tool. 
We're enhancing our security practices. We've already brought in one new vendor for security this year, looking at a very major step in the second half of the year. I think the reality is if we keep up with our workloads, we can grow the business at least a little, and we can improve our tool sets, then that is metric enough for me. And I guess I'm not a Six Sigma kind of guy in the sense that I don't believe that I need to know with one decimal precision what percentage of my text times are billable. Uh, I don't even know that for myself. But what I need to know is that on a macro level, we're moving forward and achieving the goals I have and a more micro level that I'm hitting the numbers I set for myself. Right. But people are asking those questions. And I think that a lot more people will bring folks back into the office because they have a gut feeling that they'll work better than the reality really supports. So I think that we will have, most of our sites will not abandon having buildings and actually a lot of them own their buildings, hmm. uh, including, including me which seems like less great than it did two years ago when I bought it. But the, I think the answer will be that more people will come back to work than really have to because less people than should will understand how to measure their business otherwise. Right. And that the best of our clients at those things will have a more hybrid workforce. And I hope to be one of those. I think we'll probably ultimately settle down to a mixed of, mixture of home and on-site work uh, the good news is I could grow my staff a lot more than I wanted to or could have before with this much space. Uh, the bad news is I already have four times the space that I need. <laughs> it's very roomy here. You can bounce around like a marble in this building. So uh, it's, it, I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm honestly not a, what anything like you would call a business analyst. I'm a lot more head down and in the trench. I do get out and around or used to get out and around more than most people in my industry, typically 50 trips a year and typically speaking and writing almost every week somewhere, uh, say 40 times a year. So I, I certainly get exposed to the market and to the cities, I'm sorry, to the nation more than most. But the bottom line is, I think that a lot of what changed, I think there'll be a more snapback than a lot of people are implying. Again, remember, I work for SMBs. Yeah, no, no, that's why I'm asking. More S than M. Yeah. And uh, more S than B. Yeah. But larger corporations are absolutely going to change. Yeah, yeah, no, no. but it's a, Much that's, more. That's, I, I'm asking you specifically because I, I, I felt it, was, it is different, that they will respond differently. So what is it that you've seen has caused you the most... Um, security difficulty in the last couple of months with these people working from home? Uh, absolutely. The idea that we have no visibility into what the endpoints are now. You know, we have these unknown threats, basically. I do not know what they're using to connect with. I do not know their state. Uh, now, that doesn't apply to all of them, but that probably applies to half to two thirds of the machines at this point. Some of our sites actually bought notebooks to take home. Some of them bought little NUCs, which are four by four by one and a half inch compact machines, Intel products. Uh, so those were great. A few of them already had managed machines and a, quite a few had managed notebooks. So probably only half of our endpoints are unknown. That's a whole lot of unknown endpoints, uh, sorry, of our home endpoints unknown. I mean, I. I don't think that we had five unknown endpoints one year ago, and I know we have 50 now. So those aren't huge numbers, but and we might have 100. We, we have a lot. Right. I really don't know exactly how many, yeah. uh, which is a tough thing for a security guy to say, and it sounds semi-suicidal, uh, but the reality was we, we, couldn't, we couldn't stop that flow. I mean, that river was going to run, it was going to either run over us or we were going to ride on it. So we, we uh, basically rode on it. And now we have to figure out where it's headed and how to fix that. Do you, what is the, the tool that they use that causes the most difficulties like email? Is it web browsing and downloading stuff? What is it, what is it that causes the most difficulties there? Uh, 
it, you know, it's really not a technical issue. Hmm. It's really more of a communication and understanding issue. The very same folks who point to their flat panel and call it the system or open a ticket that says um, network down because they've mistyped a URL. Those same people now have no workers around them to come over and say, press that button. The same people now have nobody watching to make sure that they don't download that free video encoder or you know engage in the possibility that they do have uh, Nigerian relatives who have passed away with a great fortune. They don't have the, the checks around them, the checks and balances of saner employees around them. So that's the biggest challenge. It's not so much technical as personal or personnel. And so they do sell your things and then they feel bad. They're afraid to ask. So it's much more of an interpersonal or a, um, I guess, cycle social management thing than it is technical. Uh, you know, they, they've been using their home computers for a long time, uh, which is part of the problem. They've been making silly decisions for a long time. The problem is that now that matters. I, I mean, if you think about a pool and there's four people swimming in an Olympic pool and one in a hundred people pee in that pool, that means there's only a, what is that, a 20% chance or so, 25% chance that one of those four people are gonna pee in the pool. When there's a hundred people in the pool, if one in a hundred people pees in that pool, there's a pretty good chance somebody's gonna pee in that pool. So we're now in that pool with a hundred people and not four. And that's really the exposures. Um, I don't know that we can stick with those same relative figures, but you understand the point. There's, yeah. there's just more risk because there's more people doing more things. Right. Uh, it's it's really tough. It, you have to educate people, but you have to be respectful about it. Uh, you have to deal with another dimension is stress. People tend to make worse decisions under stress. As that stress goes up, I can tell you that people who can shoot rapidly and that can drop 15 rounds into a four inch circle at 20 feet rapidly cannot do that when being shot upon shot at they can't virtually nobody can which is um, not something you know if you watch a lot of movies so you you're dealing with people who went from a relatively stress-free environment in the office to a home where at one level they're worried about their job a little bit that's in the back of their mind at another level, they're worried about the health of their family, the education of their children. Those people are in the home. They're running through the background of their Zoom conferences, usually clothed, but not always. <laughs> they're yelling and screaming, and they're, I mean, all kinds of things. So there's all these extra stressors, and the end result is people make worse decisions, and they do sillier things. I'm using a very kind word, sillier things, and they 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 can't be relied upon to be quite so rational as they always were right uh, which is not that much to begin with so right. there's all these dimensions they're not necessarily technical and then the managers of these people who are also people who have all the same stressors or more are also trying to figure out how to you know basically um, herd cats at the same time they're worried about whoever's hurting them and their jobs. So it's it's really quite interesting. We did not have exposure to speak of to restaurant and hospitality. The um, one customer we had that was fully restaurant and restaurant management shut their restaurant in March and then sold off their other restaurants or had just sold them off. They're still there, but they're slowly winding down. Uh, he was older than me by far. He was ready to retire. He generously reached into his own retirement funds and paid, uh, I believe, 200 people uh, severance. So that was huge. He did a lot for a lot of people. And they're closing down. So we didn't have much stress because we didn't have many heavily affected sites. But we did have two that decided to retire. We had one that was purchased by a nationwide concern and, and just this week is moving away from us. We had another one that's basically failing. So, you know, it still has an impact on us, but that impact will be 10 
or 15% of our income. I know that some MSPs saw 50% dry up overnight. And I know that some businesses saw 95%, you know, their end clients. So none of these should be construed as complaints. I don't need to be complaining, but I am noticing that even at my low level of stress, relatively low, it's more difficult to do the basic stuff. Yeah. That's bigger than I think than the tech. Yeah. So no, knowing all this, what is your most important, your number one tip for them? What should they do? Wow. My number one tip is to breathe more often and more consciously. My number two tip is to keep things in perspective. Uh, and, and remember that this will pass. It may not pass well, and it may be painful. I mean, sometimes things pass like a sneeze and other things pass more like a kidney stone, but they do eventually pass. Uh, it's easy for me to say because I'm not threatened financially as of yet, and I'm not threatened in terms of health as of yet. But the third thing is a lot of small details are smaller than you realize, and we're here to help you with that. Because we can't help you with your health, and we can't help you with your family very much, and we, we can't really deal, we can't help you breathe or concentrate or meditate, but we can make sure that there is less worry in your life on the fringes. And the details that you shouldn't have to pay attention to anyway. Right. Um, Joshua, thank you very much for your insights. Um, where can people reach you, find you? Well, I think the easiest is to go to netsciences.com, which uh, I was just prescient enough to grab in 1994, the year before I started. Because uh, in retrospect, I'm thinking, wow, it was cool to get that. Uh, so that's a good start. Uh, I have a big presence uh, on Facebook uh, and LinkedIn, I guess, is another play to reach out. Uh, I'm not crazy enough to hand up my cell number, but you can also write to info at netsciences.com by email and learn more. I would say follow me on Twitter if I ever tweeted. It's extremely rare, and the marketing people are really unhappy with me about that. But, you know, I, I certainly do participate in other ways. Most of my thoughts you probably have gleaned don't fit in 140 characters. Or I guess that's too. 280 now. Uh, but the bottom line is we're, we're out there, netsciences.com. You can follow me on, on podcasts and, and speaking. And if you go to our webpage at netsciences.com, there's a press room, yeah, press room tab, and you can see a lot more there as well. Thank you very much, Joshua. All right. Well, thank, thank you for everything. Mm -hmm.